Okay, we're going to start in one minute. Good evening, everybody. I'm David Wildstein, the editor of the New Jersey Globe. Election day is just 16 days away. And welcome to a debate between the candidates for New Jersey State Senate in the second legislative district, Democrat Vince Mazio and Republican Vince Palestina. I'll be joined tonight in asking questions of the candidates by Micah Rasmussen, the director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Ryder University. Uh, there is no legislative district in the state where the Senate seat has alternated between Democrats and Republicans more than this Atlantic County district. So this hour-long debate sponsored by the New Jersey Globe, it's coming to you virtually. Each candidate is in a different location. And I'll quickly just go through the rules. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to make an opening statement. Uh, after that, I'll ask a series of questions related to state and local issues and the campaign for state Senate. Uh, respectfully, I ask candidates to stick to their allotted time. Uh, if a candidate goes too long, I'll hold my hand up. And if that doesn't work, then I'll interrupt. Uh, these questions are ours. We have not shared them with anyone. Uh, the questions will alternate between the two candidates 
uh, at my discretion. Each candidate will have one minute to answer and we reserve the right of a follow-up question before moving on. And just to be clear, my job is to be a moderator. It's not to take sides, it's not to give my opinion, it's just to moderate. And I'll try and keep this debate on track and I will look to each of you to make sure that what your opponent says is based on fact. And if a candidate's attacked during his response, uh, his opponent will receive an extra 30 seconds. Each quest candidate will also have a chance to ask their opponent one question. Candidates will have 30 seconds to ask their question and their opponent will have 60 seconds to respond. Uh, candidates will have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Uh, we conducted a virtual coin toss before the start of the debate. Uh, Mr. Mazio won the coin toss. He's opted to give the second opening statement and the second closing statement. So Mr. Palestino, we will start the debate with you. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Micah. Thanks for uh, hosting this. It is great to have these types of forums and great to be here, of course. As you mentioned, David, uh, second district is, of course, one of the most targeted in the state, does give us the ability to run real campaigns. Uh, to hear a lot from the candidates, which is a great thing, of course, it involves people in politics and gets them involved in the process and hopefully ultimately making the best decision they can. You know, I've, uh, I grew up here. I went to school in Galloway Township, went to Rutgers University, got a degree in engineering and planning, uh, which has given me a background on many of the things that have happened in Atlanta County in terms of development and planning and uh, jobs. And so I think I bring a unique perspective uh, from my experience as an engineer and a planner uh, going to Rutgers, coming back here. What I've looked at now as I come back here and I've had a wonderful time raising my family in South Jersey, been here my entire life in Atlanta County. What I look at now with all of my three kids and now in high school is that I want them to have the same opportunities that we all enjoyed in this state uh, when we were growing up and we know and we see and we hear from people all the time that they are concerned that many of those opportunities are, are slipping away and not here anymore and so you know we hope that we can get to a situation get to a, a system where everybody has opportunity where everybody can exercise their personal responsibility you know, this country was predicated upon everybody being able to have a good job with good pay, put food on the table, provide for their family. And that's what we want to see here in South Jersey. And we have not seen that over the last decade. We've seen no population growth. Uh, we got to get this turned around from an affordability standpoint. And I think it starts right here in District 2. Thank you. Mr. Mazio. Yeah, thank you to the uh, New Jersey Globe and Dave, David for having host, hosting this this evening. I spent years serving my community first in Northfield as a councilman and then as a mayor. For the last eight years, I have on, had the honor of serving Alani County as an assemblyman. In that time, I've seen a lot of change. During my first term, Alani City was a, on the brink of bankruptcy, property taxes were out of control, and the entire region was suffering. I was actively involved in passing legislation, including the original pilot payment of lieu of taxes bill, which provided where Atlantic City casinos could no longer do tax appeals and Atlantic City would have a steady revenue uh, source. We brought Atlantic City back from complete collapse. In the four years since, we have seen the Atlantic City budget brought down from 261 million to 200 million and property taxes stabilized in the city of Atlantic City. We're seeing brighter days with new investments coming into the region. Sure, there's still work to be done to get Atlantic City back to full self-governance. We need to keep cities financing improving, diversifying our regional economy and keep Atlantic City a prime tourism destination. During the pandemic, my top priorities were keeping people safe, connecting people with resources and passing legislation that kept people in their homes and businesses open. The future of Atlantic City is much brighter than it was when I was first elected. And in the Senate, I will continue to move Atlanta County forward. I'm looking forward to this evening's discussion tonight on issues that matter most to Atlanta County and New Jersey. Mr. Palestina, um, since uh, Mr. Mazio brought it up, I'd like to ask about the payment in lieu of taxes program, which as property values change, is having a profound impact, not just in Atlantic City, but throughout the entire county. Is it working for all the taxpayers of the county? 
Does it need to be fixed? Do we need to change the pilot law in New Jersey? Well, the pilot should have never had to happen, unfortunately. It was a result of Atlantic City municipal government overvaluing those properties uh, for a period of time that resulted in tax appeals. And so I think that there are ways that we could fix the system, bring in county government to have a role in the assessment of those casinos so that we wouldn't need the pilot. I think if we had a real partnership, which we've always needed between the state county and city and we assess those properties properly then we could do away with the pilot and i think that's the direction we have to go it is shortchanging county taxpayers in some cases when you have the pilot and you have the casinos set at certain values everybody should be paying their fair amount and we should be able to get to a point through a partnership where we can all uh, pay the right amount and we can get this situation resolved so the casinos no longer are subject to the pilot yeah, the Thank you. Uh, Mr. Palestina, you, you will be a senator next month. Uh, this election will determine just how long you are a senator. Uh, and as you know, Governor Murphy has nominated Rachel Weiner after to be an associate justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Uh, if the Senate votes on the Weiner after nomination before the end of the current legislative term, Will you vote to confirm her or reject her? So some would say I'm a uh, senator now, David. <laughs> There's a big question here, but I, uh, you know, I've read the Constitution. I've read the Senate rules. Uh, clearly, they indicate that I have been properly sworn in. And so I think that I am the senator right now, even though some don't want to recognize that. Uh, in terms of the Supreme Court nomination, you know, it's the governor's prerogative to nominate who he wants. I will certainly uh, do the vetting that is necessary to take a look at her nomination. Uh, but off the top of my head right now, I wouldn't see a reason not to uh, vote to confirm her. But, you know, I'd still have to do my due diligence, still take a look at it and uh, make sure there's nothing that I saw that would create a situation where I felt obligated to vote against her. Mr. Mazio. On that question there. Yes. Yeah, I, I would. Uh you know, lean to, to exactly get the best person who, who um, is fit for the, for the justice. I certainly would, uh, you know, make sure that I, I do my due diligence and, and look through exactly what um, her history is, what she means to the court. I certainly would uh, lean heavily on the, on the governor exactly why he, he picked her. And at the end of the day, probably would confirm her. Thank you. And go back to Atlantic City. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, David. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, if we can go back to Atlantic City, this is a question I think for both of you. Um, Jack Cittarelli says he's going to end state control in Atlantic City. Is is he right? Are we ready for that? No. No. At this time, you know, we've un, under the Chris Christie administration. Uh, you know, that was a as a bully pul pulpit where I, I don't think the the partnership was there as far as the state and the city, uh, the, the, the city uh, commit, uh, council people and the mayor to have a working relationship. Under the, the partnership of uh, uh, Governor Murphy right now, it seems to be working better. You know, property taxes have stabilized. Um, we see a lot of investment with Stockton. We see uh, Atlantic Care. I think you're going to see the, the diversification of the economy with uh, clean energy, resiliency program, stopped and expanding. So, um, you know, I, I believe that's why if you look at the, if, if you look at, at the, the takeover in the beginning of 2016, and now we, you know, there was a lot of pushback, but as we extended it four more years, it seems there was no pushback because I think that the governor and the elected officials right now in the city of Atlantic City, and for that matter, in the county are working well together. So I think it's interesting, Micah, they had to uh, bring in a Republican state senator now to oversee Atlantic City. I think that uh, tells you about the state of New Jersey and the fact that they should really uh, take a look at their priorities in Trenton. I mean, we have issues with Division of Motor Vehicles and uh, Department of Labor with unemployment. There are so many challenges in the state of New Jersey that they could uh, work on. I think that their focus could be better used on other things. That being said, we're not there to have Atlantic City Municipal Government turn back over to itself. I think Atlantic County Government is right there in the building right next to Atlantic City. Let's develop a real partnership 
uh, between the state, the county, the city, with Senator Brown leading the charge, who's got a background in municipal government and state government and all kinds of experience. I think it can be done with a real partnership with county government, and we can do it much more effectively, much better for the people of this region. Thank you. Mr. Mazio. Vince Palestina was elected to fill a vacancy in the state Senate, uh, but leaders of your party have not sworn him in. And in the context of the national Republicans seeking to deny Joe Biden the presidency, despite his legitimate election, how do you justify pre preventing a state senator lawfully elected from taking the oath of office? Well, it's funny, you know, because uh, uh, Mr. Palestino, he, he um, sent out letterhead with, with saying that he was a senator. I thought he was the senator. And, you know, I, I'm, running, I'm running for state senate, and I'm the assembly right now. And, and under, under the last, I guess, the, the, the speaker, as far as uh, the president of the senate, he actually sets the agenda for when, the, when, the, when they come back to vote, and it's going to be after the election. So that's his call. I have no say over what the agenda is and when they're going to appoint Mr. Palestina. But it's funny, it seemed he was saying that, you know, he he was a senator. He had a letter in, sent it to my actually to my office stating, you know, that he that he looked for my help as, as far as him becoming senator. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I thought the way that he presented himself, he was the senator. Thank you. So yeah, I am the senator. I have been sworn in. I am the senator. The issue, of course, as you know, David, is that they literally locked the office doors to the uh, district office. You know, sitting there the day that the Office of Legislative Services came down, the phones were ringing, things were going on. They came down, very nice guys from the Office of Legislative Services, and they physically locked the doors. I got on the uh, phone with Trenton and said, look, all I want is to be able to answer the phones for people. Of course, now we are dealing with these challenges with unemployment, the pandemic, uh, MVC. There are many issues that people need help with. I just wanted to help people. They prevented me from being able to help our constituents here in the region, which is very, very sad. It's just a sad commentary on politics in the state of New Jersey. There was no reason for it. Would have been a 30 second phone call and it would have been resolved, uh, but they refused to do it. Just a quick follow up uh, then for Mr. Mazio. Uh, first, um, turning those phones off, uh, leaving Atlantic County without a third working legislative office. Did that put the county at a disadvantage, constituents who are already working with that office? Is that well, something that, be that really denied Atlantic County that third? Go ahead. Go ahead. My understanding, uh, Senator Brown's uh, actually people in the office, I believe, left. And a lot of them, um, the chief of staff at the time, actually gave a lot of the unemployment issues to our office um, so we can handle them. And as you know, the unemployment was an extension, our office was an extension from the Department of Labor to resolve a lot of these um, issues that were concerning to unemployment, the DMV, et cetera. So um, I think the continuity of government, it certainly uh, wasn't, in jeopard wasn't jeopardized uh, but again, I don't, I didn't make that decision. I don't make that decision as far as when Mr. Palestina gets sworn in. And my understanding under the um, statute that Mr. Palestino is, is Senator Select right now. So, Mr. Yeah, Palestino, I mean, do you I mean, want to respond? Just, Mr. Palestino, well, you want just, to follow just, up? Just to follow up. I mean, we still have been able to help people as much as we can. I have given out you know, a personal cell phone number. I still get calls from people on that about senior freeze and about unemployment, uh, about all the issues that they have with state government. So we have done what we can try to do to help people, but there's no question when people had that number, and it's been the same number for the Republican Legislative Office in District 2 since when I started in the Assembly in 2008, it's been the same main office number, that when you turn that number off and now you get a recording that says, you know, Senator Brown's no longer in office. Go to www.njleg.org and find another legislator. But if you don't have a computer or you don't know what to do, there's no question that that has hurt constituents in this district and should nev never have happened. Thank you. Mr. Palestina, this next question, it, it comes from the broken record of New Jersey 
political debates. I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Just about every candidate in almost every election says that New Jersey taxes are too high. Every candidate promises to cut the taxes. Uh, that's a bipartisan promise, but they never really do. So I'm hoping maybe, please, you'll make some news tonight. Uh, can you be the one candidate to use specifics and tell me how you'll cut taxes for New Jersey? Well, I think there are a number of ways to cut taxes, David. I think that when you look at all the taxes that were raised over the last four years, we could start right there. And I think when you look at the educational funding, I know Governor uh, uh, Chitterelli has talked about it, but we have to come to a point where every child starts out with an equal amount of funding uh, so that we can equalize and give every child an equal opportunity for success. And I think in doing that, if you don't have these you know, situations where you have one group or one area against another, I think that we can actually deal with the property tax issue. There's no question that if we were fiscally disciplined, that if we don't just raise budgets and we don't just borrow money we don't need and we really make New Jersey affordable, that we can get this tax situation under control. And David, I know everybody talks about it. I know we hear it all the time. It's the number one issue in New Jersey. We have got to do it. It has to be done because we continue to see opportunities lost in New Jersey. If we don't really deal with this, we're going to continue to have issues in New Jersey, even to the governor now saying he's not going to raise taxes. It's gotten to that point where he has pledged for four years not to raise taxes. Mr. Mazio? Well, I have a long history of, uh, as a councilman, as a mayor in Northfield, where we've uh, consolidated services with the courts. We've done shared services with our uh, police departments where we had his chair, ch chair chief. And, you know, as an assemblyman, we've done some good things this past, past couple budgets as far as fully funding the property tax relief program, the senior freeze, the homestead rebate. You know, the part uh, Mr. Palestine is talking about is the school funding formula. We have done a good job as far as reformulating the school funding formula. So, you know, these, these are things that, um, that we are doing and, and that continue to do. The idea of uh, property tax relief, you know, we, there is a bill on the desk as far as uh, school board administration. If you look at areas, say, particularly in Atlantic County, where you have Northfield, Linwood, Summers Point, they have four school districts. Can we somehow consolidate that to one school district? That would save millions of dollars for the property taxes uh, for residents in Atlanta County. We'll stick with the uh, communities of Atlanta County if we can. Um, and, and I'd like to ask about how you balance, you both represented this district um, and are looking to represent this district. Um, how do you, the Atlanta County has such a mix of, of urban, suburban and rural districts uh, with really some, some very diverse um, demands. How do you balance those out? And I think this is a question for uh, Mr. Mazio first. Is that right, right David? I, sure. I think yeah. some, some of the ways is, of course, is we talk about diversifying the economy and diversifying, uh, if you talk about Atlantic City, some of the issues that they're facing is, you know, they have, um, you know, the part of youth programs. Uh, myself, we, we provide a $1.5 million uh, re uh, budget resolution to help with youth programs in Atlantic City. I think that's that's a uh, issue that we we need to do. Atlantic City is made up of probably in, in the school districts, 34 different languages. So the idea of, of going out, and I've been to a lot of these community events, knowing the needs and the jobs of these people. And when we talk about economic development, we must talk about uh, providing education piece. And that's why as, uh, assemblyman, we've been talking to ACIT, having having actually resources brought to the ACIT, uh, actually uh, Cape Col uh, Atlanta Cape College, also Stockton, as far as um, meeting the needs of these new jobs that we're trying to do. Um, we have the possibility of having, we talk about um, uh, diversifying our energy, that is diversifying our economy, but we need to do the education piece as far as going into these colleges and making sure that the education piece uh, fits the work and exactly helping, that'll keep people here in Atlantic County. 
Uh, we have on the, okay, sorry. It's okay. Thanks, Mike. It is a very diverse district. I mean, you have urban areas in AC and Pleasantville, the suburban with EHT, Hamilton Township out to the farms of Buna and Buna Vista. It's a very, you know, geographically diverse district. It's very diverse with the people of the district. This question, how do you help everyone, starts with Atlantic City. We have, you know, the fact that I'm now 50 years old and Resorts Casino opened when I was seven. It's been 43 years and that city still looks the way it does is a travesty. There has been billions upon billions of dollars invested. We have not adequately done the job. There are parts of the city that still look horrible. We got to get them cleaned up. We got to make people understand that it's safe. We got to get more police on the streets. Police force is down by about 60 people. Uh, we got to make sure we're supporting our law enforcement so they can do the job and give them the tools and the resources they need to get the job done. But this question, how do you help the entire district? It starts in Atlantic City. We have got to finally do the job to get that city to be a real destination resort. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mazio, I want to ask you another question. Uh, in the 8th district, it, it, it's, it's literally right next door to yours. Democrats are running TV ads, slamming a Republican assemblywoman for opposing a bill that extended benefits to essential employees who conduct who contracted COVID. Uh, but you abstained on the same bill. So if it's fair for your party to criticize a Republican for it, I'm going to use the, the words of a nurse that appeared in the ad, stick it to the essential worker. Why shouldn't Mr. Palestina run the same ad and just switch your name out? Well, <laughs> it's funny. I, I, um, I'm not sure of the bill that you're talking about, but I, I think that, um, you know, when we're talking about essential employees, I only could think about myself as far as the, uh, when COVID hit and my, my business was hit and we didn't know what, what to do as far as uh, the, the, social distancing, the sneeze guards, as far as masking. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly feel that we need to, to make, when, we have, when we're talking about essential employees providing um, funding and making sure they're taken care of. So, um, you know, Mr. Palestina, I know he's, he's attacked me on, on many things. And, and one thing that, uh, you know, we, we look at is the, is the ad from six years ago and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty funny that you have to go back six years ago and start uh, advertising things that, uh, you know, that, that I did at a debate over six years ago. So anything can happen. You're criticizing stuff from 2004, Vince, when you started adding up all that stuff. Come on now. But in terms of the uh, frontline workers, I think they deserve uh, whatever hazard pay we can give them. I think, you know, this was very unknown when it started. Uh, people went out, risked their lives in some cases, not knowing uh, what the outcomes were going to be in some cases. And so I think they do deserve it. The only reason we don't attack them on that is unfortunately, we don't have as much money as them, of course. They have a unlimited pot of money. They you know, launch attacks about everything and everyone that they possibly can. Uh, if we had the same amount of money to compete with them, uh, then I'm sure you would see a lot uh, different ads and a lot more ads on our end too. But unfortunately, the one thing that he mentioned is the one thing that people talk about here the most. You know, when you can't even answer a simple question about how your name gets whited out on a resolution, you stumble around, you can't answer it for 30 seconds. That's what people mention to me as I'm going out and campaigning primarily. And so that's the thing that people are talking about. That's the thing that you're seeing running on TV. Yeah, well, thank you. Go ahead. You know, he, he talks about affordability, but he gets 60% of his money from the taxpayers, property taxpayers in uh, Atlantic County. So, you know, he, he can, he could talk about affordability. He could talk about, uh, you know, me whiting out and, and, and all that. But the, the fact of the matter is I worked hard to fight against North Jersey casinos and we beat it 80 to 20% uh, in 2016. I never saw Vince Palestina around during their time. I, I didn't see him fighting against North Jersey casinos, but now he's a big advocate for that. And I wonder because Chris Christie was for North Jersey casinos. If, if Mr. Palestina would continue to vote the way that Chris Christie wanted instead of voting his conscience. 
Vince, any legislator down here in District 2 has an obligation to be against North Jersey casinos without a doubt. You should have stood with Chris Brown. You should have signed the resolution. You should have done what you could do to be a voice to prevent North Jersey casinos. You didn't do it. We all know you didn't do it. You can't. It was, not, it was a non-binding resolution. It didn't mean anything. It was a Let political posturing. It didn't mean Hold anything. Hold on. Let me talk. Okay. Yeah. okay. So you didn't do it. Everybody knows you didn't do it. In terms of the revenue events, come on. This is such a tired, broken record. I run a business. I took a risk starting a business. I employ people. We do great work for many municipalities in Atlantic County. And it is a business that generates revenue like every business needs to, to pay its employees, pay health care, pay insurance, pay everything else that goes into running a business. It's a business. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mike. It's okay, sure, sure. Um, so since we're talking about Atlantic Atlantic City casinos. Let's uh, let's talk about what the plan is to get people to return to casinos and to entertainment in Atlantic City. And I think this question is for Mr. Palestina first. So I think I talked uh, quite a bit about what we need to do. Obviously, you know, back in 2006 and 2007, before gaming uh, started in other jurisdiction, we had a monopoly. It was a much different situation. You had those buildings. The casinos always wanted to keep people inside the buildings. Uh, there wasn't a real need like there is now to try to diversify that Atlantic City economy, get the city cleaned up, uh, make sure that it's safe uh, and there's no trash out on the streets so that people will go there and walk around and patronize those facilities. So what we, we need to do now is to do that, is to start a real program of getting that city cleaned up, a real program of redevelopment with planning for redevelopment and then funding for redevelopment to get some of those dilapidated buildings down, uh, get more police officers on the street. And I think the optimal number is 330. They need to be visible. They need to be part of the community uh, and they need to be seen and interact with the community. And so there are things that must be done for the city of Atlantic City. We have generated billions upon billions of dollars over there. We can do this. We just have to spend that money appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Mazio. Yeah, we, we talk, you know, we're talking about diversifying the economy, making non-gaming events. Where there's a there's talk of putting, you know, a water park, extending the Orange Loop in, a, in Atlantic City, putting a hotel there. These are all different avenues for people to come in. You know, we did a great job of, uh, of putting sports betting. You know, you have, you have people come to Atlantic City who, who can go for a weekend as far as if they want to go to the final four. These are things that will track people into, into Atlantic City. Uh, part of the, you know, you talk about the, the police department. The police department is, is working with the community in, in, a, in a very good way. We have Chief, well, I, I wish he was Chief Sar Sarkos, who works with community uh, people to, to, to make sure that everything is here, what the police are doing. There's a group called the NCO which is the neighborhood uh, captain officer. And there's a group, they, they actually go to different, like the Chelsea uh, organizations and things of that nature and talk about how we can be better policed in these neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Palestina, according to reports, you recently filed with the New Jersey Election Law Enforcement Commission, uh, a prominent Atlantic City Democrat, Craig Calloway, is working for your campaign. What's his job? What's he doing? Well, there's a lot of people working for our campaign, David. We have many different constituencies, many different people, and anyone who has indicated they want to help with our campaign, we certainly are going to talk to them and uh, potentially work with them. So he is a you know get out the vote specialist. Uh, he is out there working in Atlantic City, Pleasantville, and other communities about getting out the vote. Obviously, you know, especially with early voting now starting on October 23rd, there's gonna be an election where it is very, very important to get people out to vote, you know, whether it's early voting or whether it's in person on election day. And so we are working with many, many people uh, to make sure that everyone who wants to vote can vote and legally exercises their vote. And so, uh, you know, he was uh, Jeff Van Drew's political consultant last year in Jeff Van Drew's campaign, and he's fulfilling a similar role for us this year. Thank you, Mr. Mazio. Yeah, I think, you know, Don Guardian hired, a, you know, his running mate for his semi hired two private detect 
private detectives to investigate alleged ballot fraud at the hand of the Callaways. So I, I don't know really hiring the Callaways is a good idea, but um, you know, Mr. Palestina uh, probably thought that was a, a good idea to get votes, but uh, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have used them. So we talked a little bit about the pandemic. Um, I wanna ask uh, both of you, if I could, Mr. Mazio first, are mask mandates helping to keep our schools open? And are vaccine mandates um, helping to get unvaccinated Americans vaccinated? I think it's important the mandates, you know, that, uh, I'm sorry, the mandates for the, for the mask are, uh, you know, helping to, to, keep, to keep the COVID uh, pandemic down, keeping people safe. I think it's important, you know, particularly we have it in our schools. I think that's important. The idea of vaccination, I, you know, we, we have to follow the science and it's important that we follow the science and more people vaccinated, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer that, that, that this pandemic will go away. And I think that New Jersey did a good job rolling out the vaccine. If you look at these mega sites, I think we did a very good job. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important that everyone gets uh, vaccinated. And uh, if we have to uh, mandate in these some way, it's, it's very important. I think it's, I think it's a, uh, a good thing. So in terms of all these mandates, I think that the, the biggest concern I have had, certainly early on, uh, the steps were taken that were necessary to make sure that we were protected. I think it's going on very, very, very long. The legislature has not fully exercised their role in this. And I think the biggest concern that I hear from people down here uh, around these mandates is that it's such a top-down approach that they have not involved local communities, they haven't involved local school boards, to the point now where people try to speak out to school boards and are being shouted down, in some cases called domestic terrorists or something. It is unbelievable what is happening. So I think we need to involve local input, uh, the local community, I think in terms of masks, everyone should have a mask when they're going in, everyone should have it when they're in their common areas, I don't know that Unite need to mask kids all day long while they're sitting at desks. I think we can safely and responsibly figure out ways to do this without masking people all day long. Uh, in terms of vaccines, we need to uh, encourage everybody uh, to get vaccinated again. We need to make sure people are getting the information they need, making the best decision they can. Thank you. I have a, a question for both of you, uh, and and we'll we'll start with with Mr. Palestina. Nine of New Jersey's 21 counties have never elected a woman to the state Senate uh, or, frankly, uh, elected anyone other than a white man to the state Senate. Six of those nine are in South Jersey. Uh, but here we are for four middle aged plus white guys having a conversation about this election. Uh, since women won the right to vote 121 years ago, only one woman, Dolores Cooper, my, my, my late friend, has represented Atlantic County in Trenton. She retired 30 years ago. So here's my question. We'll start with Mr. Palestina. Tell me why voters shouldn't just split their tickets and send Claire Swift and Karen Fitzpatrick to the assembly this year. Well, I think, uh, you know, from my standpoint, obviously I believe people should uh, vote for all three of us, myself, Don Guardi and Claire Swift. I think that we are, you know, are a very diverse ticket very different uh, backgrounds, of course. You know, Don, former mayor of Atlantic City, openly gay Republican. He's about to be the first openly gay Republican serving in the state legislature in history. Claire is a former deputy attorney general, uh, you know, protecting children and families throughout her career. So I think that we bring uh, diversity uh, to the ticket that is really going to represent this area well. Again, when we talk about the diversity of the area, I think the three of us bring different backgrounds, different perspectives, different beliefs that I think are going to lend well to serving all of the people in this region. So, I mean, to your point, it is unbelievable that there has only been one Republican woman legislator or one woman legislator uh, in itself from Atlantic County. It's just 2021. Just unbelievable that that's still the case. But I think you're, we're on the precipice uh, of changing that now. Thank you. Mr. Mazio. Yeah, well, I could go back to when I remember I became mayor of the city of Northfield and we had uh, my position, councilman at large, open. And I actively uh, looked for a woman to take my, uh, my spot as councilman at large. And I actually uh, uh, did that because we didn't have any women representing. I think there was 
one woman on on the board, and I thought that you know we need a one one woman on the board, another woman on the board representing from from the Democrats, and I uh, I proposed uh, Julie Zlotnick at the time, and and she lasted two years, I think, on the board. But you know I, I think it's important that you have uh, women into the uh, legislative branches throughout the state. I mean, we're a diverse, uh, we're a diverse state, you know, people of color, I think it's important as well. And I think that, uh, you know, I am always for women being on uh, leg legislative and any board because they come, they, they bring unique positions to many of the issues that face a lot of people. Thank you. And, and at this point in the debate, uh, it's time for each candidate to have an opportunity to ask one question of their opponent. Uh, under the guidelines, the, uh, the, Mr. Palestina will go first. You'll have 30 seconds to ask your question. Uh, Mr. Mazzi will have one minute to respond. Uh, and then if you wish, uh, 30 seconds after that for rebuttal. So, Mr. Palestina, we'll start with you. Yeah, Assemblyman, thanks. The, uh, we talked a little bit about the pilot. We didn't fully discuss uh, the efforts uh, to once again exclude online gaming and online sports betting revenue uh, from the calculation of gross gaming revenue. Of course, as you now know, you know that was done and posted in your committee, uh, never discussed with Atlantic County, even though it would have had a tremendous impact on Atlantic County. Can you explain the rationale of why that was done and why you would not speak to Atlantic County uh, before something like that was proposed? Well, as you know, I um, I was the author of the uh, the first pilot bill, payment in lieu of taxes, and you know it was looked upon from the other side, quite frankly, the Republicans who said that this bill was a bad bill. And moving forward to 2021, we saw that the the revenue it's based on gaming revenue dollars, which in the first year of the pilot, I think the the, the casinos got 120, and this year or before COVID, they, they received $150 million. So the pilot bill actually saved Atlantic City because it stopped the tax appeals and it also um, provided a, a revenue to the city of Atlantic City. But you know, when we talk about, I've always talked to the Casinos Association, everyone else, I said, what are we gonna do after the pilot? And many of them said, are we gonna continue with it? Or are we gonna uh, have go, go put them back on the tax roll and perhaps have somebody who is an expert in casino um, assessment. But this idea of the sports betting and the internet gaming, I think it should stay in the bill. And I think that if we're talking about gaming revenue dollars, that it's important that um, for the pilot that that stays in place. Thank you, Mr. Policy, let me give you 30 seconds to respond. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, but one of the things that we need to do when we are an elected official is talk to all the interested parties uh, that are going to be impacted by potential legislation. This was, again, done in the middle of the night, May, June. Uh, nobody was told about it. You know, and it, it was going to take county taxpayer dollars and it was going to give it to those casino operators at a time when we have so many challenges in this region, in this city, uh, should not have happened uh, should never happen again. We need to make sure that we're using that money appropriately where it needs to be spent. Thank you. And Mr. Mazio, it's, it's your turn to ask a question, Mr. Palestina. Okay. You have, you have reference affordability and taxes throughout this race. Have, however, you have made over 10.8 million from taxpayer funded contracts steered to your engineering firm by your friends and cronies in government. 260,000 in Hamilton, half a million dollars in Galloway, and over 3 million Egg Harbor Township alone. If you are elected, will you agree to give up these contracts and stop profiting off the taxpayers you will also be representing? We talked about this broken record earlier, Vince, but I'm happy to talk about it again. You know, I, I came back to this area. I started a business, took a risk in 2004, uh, developed an engineering company, which of course, as you know, being a mayor, uh, serving in local government, Municipalities must have engineers, Vince. We do very vital work in terms of building roads and bridges and parks and sewer systems and water systems. My employees, my company have done excellent work 
for many municipalities across this region. I'm very proud of what we've done. It is a success story for this region. I'm not gonna to apologize to anyone for the success that we have had because we have done great work at great prices and I'll put up what we have done, my employees who have done tremendous work against anyone. So this is a tired record, same thing over and over again. Uh, we've been successful and I don't apologize for that. Similar to the whiteout. You don't apologize for the whiteout? Is that what you're saying? No, I said it's similar to the whiteout. I said you just it's a it's a broken record. <laughs> you didn't you weren't clear there. I don't know that that's a broken record though, Vince. That's what everybody wants to talk about here. Nobody when I'm walking down the street is talking about my engineering contracts when I'm to talk about the whiteout. Yeah. They want to talk about I the think whiteout. I'm go on to the next okay. question, David. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. I've never heard anybody talk about the whiteout. <laughs> So uh, we talked, David, you brought a little a little while of, about the uh, history of this legislative seat, uh, Atlanta County legislators. I want to go back to that theme a little bit. Historically, enormous power has been wielded from this seat, um, uh, either as chairman of the Judiciary Committee or, or through the party apparatus. The beneficiary was invariably Atlanta County. What's your vision on how you're going to leverage this seat to deliver for the county? And I think it goes to Assemblyman Mazio first. Well, I, I always say this, I don't take, you know, any time in my public service of any position that I hold, I hold it to the utmost, uh, you know, ethical standard. And I think it's important when we, we take on this position as a Senator, uh, you know, when we get the senator, senatorial courtesy of uh, picking judges and prosecutors and things of that nature, the, the point is that, you know, you get the best possible person to help to help with whoever the judgeship is or the prosecutor to make sure that you get the best person, the best quality person to do these jobs. And I will continue on as a, a senator. I think I've done a very good job with constituent services and providing not only my office, but my store is a very uh, uh, big part as far. I'm very accessible. And I think that you know, moving from the assembly to the Senate, I certainly, um, I guess it's a move up, but I certainly never forget where I came from because I'm doing work for the people. So Mike, I think uh, this is about just trying to do the right thing. I do believe the policies that we advocate for are gonna be best for the people of this region. Certainly, as you indicated, it's always been a pretty high profile uh, seat, but it is one of 40, you know, one of 820 in the legislature. And so what we're going to do is advocate for policies uh, related to affordability of this state, related to redevelopment and reinvestment in Atlantic City, uh, related to diversifying the economy in this region, uh, related creating jobs in this region. And so while this is a little different than some in the state, our role is the same, our job is the same, to make sure that we are giving people opportunities to work hard, put food on the table, provide for their families. Thank you. Mr. Palestina, and, and by the way, congratulations to both candidates. We are, uh, we're 45 minutes into a debate and nobody has mentioned any former presidents of the United States, but that, that will, uh, will change now. Mr. Palestina, this week, uh, Congressman Jeff Van Drew told CNN that he would support Donald Trump for president in 2024 if he runs. What would you do? Yeah, I don't know that right now, David. I can't imagine, uh, given what we had seen, that I would uh, be supporting him in 2024. But that, I mean, we're in 2021 now. It's three, uh, three more years out. So, you know, the congressman has his own opinions and beliefs on it. I think that. Uh, that period of time was a period of time which was pretty divisive, wasn't necessarily uh, healthy for the country. And so I think that we need to uh, build a system where people come together, end this divisiveness and end this bitterness and end this acrimony. Uh, we got to come back together as Republicans and Democrats and try to get things done. And so I think that's uh, someone who I would be looking for uh, as the next, next presidential candidate. That's Thank him, you. if not somebody else. Thank you. Mr. Mazio, I don't suppose we're going to make a whole lot of news with what you're about to say, but. Yeah, I, I, you know, with Jeff Van, uh, Congressman Van Drew, you know, that's his, uh, his, his decision for Trump. He, uh, in my eyes, he owed him, he owes him at least one for uh, when he switched parties. And I think that, um, 
you know, that, that's his, that's his play. And he, and he seems to, um, seems to be playing that every uh, issue that he, that he goes through about Donald Trump. But, you know, John, Donald Trump has um, made this country, I believe, divisive. I think that, you know, again, we need, we need to, to work together. And that's, that's what I've always done. I, I worked in a bipartisan way with, with uh, a lot of my, my issues and my bills that we talked about. I'm the chairman of state and local government. I work with both sides of the aisle and I, and I try to get uh, work done that that's good for all people of Atlantic County and New Jersey. So Thank turn, you. turn, turn about is, is fair play here, right? If we're going to talk about who's beholden, I guess the question for Assemblyman Mazio starting with is um, uh, as Senator, will you be beholden to South Jersey Democrats um, or not, you know, as, as a major funder of your campaign? Uh, no, you know, this always comes up like I'm a, a Camden County, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hold to the Camden County bosses. That's that's never the case. I mean, we've we've I've gone against a lot of people who you know the railroad line in Atlantic City. We've talked about the uh, conventions in, in Atlantic City with with uh, opening them up. You know, my myself. I think it's um, you know I, I'm an independent thinker, and if you want to look at things, my opponent. I think every time he ran lock stock with Chris Christie. And I think that uh, a difference. He's always saying I'm the Camden bosses, but he's he's always voted the way Chris Christie wanted him to vote. Well, that's what uh, that's what people say around here, Vince. Again, that's what people say. You know it, and you hear it all the time too. They don't believe that you're not beholden to the Camden bosses, but it is what it is. And in terms of Chris Christie, I served there for two years under John Corzine, two years under Chris Christie. Uh, they will tell you I was the most independent legislator. Uh, in the state at that time to the point where Chris Christie actually had a tracker standing behind me while I was voting to make sure that he, I was uh, voting the way he was looking for. So that's how independent I was, where I actually had a tracker, independent tracker standing behind me while I was voting. So nobody's ever going to question my independence. I do the right thing for the region, as I always will. Why'd you vote against sports betting? What? You voted against sports betting. I did not. Yes, you did. Okay, we'll look that one up too. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I think my question now is for, for Mr. Palestina. Atlantic City officials are, are seeking to shut down a needle exchange program uh, that some people say provides clean syringes as a way of harm reduction. Do you oppose this or do you support it? I think we need the needle exchange program. I think that uh, the location has got to be improved just like we did with John Brooks and some of the other social services that were in Atlantic City. Just certain areas where these things are appropriate, certain areas where they are not when you're looking at a tourism destination. And so I think while the needle exchange program is important, is necessary, is something that we should look to continue, we got to, again, with the redevelopment of Atlantic City, redevelopment of the region, we got to look for the right locations for these things. And we can do this. My background is an engineer and a planner. We'll figure it out. We'll find the right location. We'll get the money uh, necessary to get it open and running. Uh, we can do it. You know, it's not that difficult. Mr. Mazio. Yeah, I, I believe the needle exchange is a, is a, is a good, is a good program. And, um, unbelievable, but I, I agree with uh, Mr. Palestina, perhaps that it could be put in a different place as far as uh, where they, uh, where this program is, everyone comes to gather. I think that we've, we've had talk about perhaps having like a campus where we have the Atlantic City Rescue Mission, perhaps a syringe, things of that nature. So it's out of the tourism district. Um, and these are things that you have to work for. You know, it, it, helped, it helps a lot of people, and I think it's an important uh, program. So I, I think that uh, somehow we have to come with some type of agreement and perhaps somewhere we could put this program that it's not in where everybody sees it on the streets in, in the tourism district. According to the 2020 census, Atlantic County's population did not grow over the last 10 years. In actual numbers, it lost 15 people since 2010. Um, that the county has only ever not grown once before, and that was in the 1940 census. 
what needs to happen to get the county moving again? And how can you help as Senator? And I think this is for uh, Mr. Mazio first. It, I think that uh, we have to continue to diversify in the economy. We have uh, Stockton, we have Atlantic Care, you know, we mentioned uh, we have the um, diversifying of the energy or, or the blue, blue economy. We have uh, Orsted, we have Atlantic Shores, uh, wind turbines. And also we have to look at Atlantic uh, City Airport, the aviation park. We have um, a second building that's going to be uh, breaking ground. These are all things that will bring in different uh, type of uh, people to attract them. And also, you know, we could talk about one of the ideas that I have is, is to make sure Atlantic City, we, we go from rental occupancy, we go from owner occupancy to, to rental. Right now, rental to owner occupancy is somewhere around 30 to 70 percent. I have a bill that I've been working on actually for about five years trying to get it where we give tax incentives to construction companies to allow uh, to build these construct uh, residential areas where um, 80 percent would be owner occupancy to 20% rental occupancy. These are things that perhaps would bring people to our region. We have got to make Atlantic County affordable. Uh, we have seen over the last four years, you know, this increased spending, increased debt, increased taxes. It is crippling this economy down here. We have got to get to a point where we stop uh, spending all this money irresponsibly. We got to get our priorities straight, spend the money on the things that are necessary. Uh, but we got to make New Jersey more affordable for people. If you're trying to start out a family, you want opportunities here, you're trying to put food on the table, provide for your family, or you're trying to retire here. It is unaffordable. People feel it. They know it and they're leaving. The other thing is the regulatory environment with the overarching regulations between Pinelands and DEP and affordable housing create this mix of a myriad of regulatory issues that people have to deal with. It gives people pause in investing capital in getting these projects done because you have no sense of how long it's going to take you to get to the finish line to get a shovel in the ground. And so there are a number of things that we need to do here in Atlantic County, uh, starts around affordability. Thank you. Mr. Mazio, my, my question's about the ban of smoking inside casinos and, and uh, uh, the fault of, of neither of you, it's, it's, it's on me, but the more stories I read about this issue uh, in the press of Atlantic City, the more confused I am as to where everybody stands. So, so let's hit a reset button. Uh, do you support banning smoking in casinos? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, and Mr. Palestina? Yeah, I mean, we have been clear on this. He's now coming uh, late to the game and you know, finally to the table. Uh, we have been clear on this from the start. There's no reason, there was no smoking while the pandemic was going on, while people were wearing masks in the casinos. Casinos did fine. There is no reason why that exemption still exists. You're not allowed to smoke on the boardwalk. You're not allowed to smoke on the beach. There's no reason now why people would be smoking in these Atlantic City casinos. The exemption needs to end. I know the governor supports it, so hopefully we can get back uh, to Trenton after this election and we can get it done because those people deserve clean air and a healthy, safe work environment. And Mr. Mazio? Yeah, he... Uh, during the COVID, the governor was going to lift the ban, and we, we made calls to the governor's office to make sure that that was extended even further. And, and as far as this, the banning on the boardwalks and the beaches, that was my, my legislation that I did. And I, I'm in agreement, and we have to continue to try and make sure that we um, ban smoking in the casinos. Thank you. That's an epiphany over two weeks ago, because two weeks ago, I wanted to talk to Pennsylvania and others about the issue. There's no reason for this now. We got to be done with it. Mr. Mazio, you let me give you 10 more seconds. Well, there's always if, if that's a way we can resolve this. But, you know, we, as far as talking to other other people, you know, we are the majority party in, in New Jersey. So we can we can talk to other uh, legislators. It is a competitive. There's other there's more people. There's more players involved here. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I believe the health and welfare of the people who work in the casinos is more important. Yeah. Mr. Palestini, you brought up the uh, Pinelands Commission a second ago, and um, not a single Pinelands Commissioner has come up to my knowledge that I can think of uh, during uh, for confirmation in the Senate 
um, during Governor Murphy's term in office. Um, what can we do to get this unstuck um, and to get the commission up to full force so that we can maybe get rid of some of these delays and, and backups that, you, that you're referencing? Yeah, I think uh, we have an obligation as legislators to go speak to the governor about the issue. I think if he comes down here and talks to some of our local communities, uh, he would understand the impact that the commission has on some of our lower growth communities where uh, many of the uh, land is in public control. They don't pay taxes. We got to make sure that those towns are fully funded uh, to the higher growth towns, which are, you know, supposed to take all of the growth from the Atlantic City casino development. So I think if we can get the governor down here, the legislators down here, educate them on some of the issues uh, that are going on down here with some of our pilots communities. I think that we can move the ball off the of center and we have to, you know, we got to move the ball off of this off the of center on a number of these issues uh, with state government where you just they, see things languishing. Mr. Mazio. Yeah, I think it's important to get the governor down here as well and making sure that we, you know, we get these, uh, this board filled. I think it's, you know, the Pinelands uh, has been a, you know, po problematic for this region for a lot of, for a lot of reasons. And I think that, uh, you know, it hasn't really, my office has complained where it hasn't had a quorum in, in some time uh, for like two years. So I think that we need to, to address these issues. The, the Pinelands Commission itself, uh, because it's there to do a job and, and it has to do a job. If it's not, if it's not meeting with a quorum, then, then there's a problem. So we have to, to address these issues and, and certainly, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an important um, commission to, to make things happen in, in the Pinelands. Thank you. Uh, just one one last question before we go to closing statements. Uh, uh, Mr. Maggio, you're the co-sponsor of the Reproductive Freedom Act uh, that seeks to codify Roe v. Wade into state law. Uh, that bill was introduced 363 days ago. It hasn't received any consideration by the committee. You just mentioned the Democrats are, are in control. Are you prepared to vote for that bill uh, right now, as is, without any amendments? And, and why does a bill that people say is just so ginormously important, why has it gone two days short of a year without any action? Well, it's, there's no secret that, uh, you know, this, this is a controversy bill, you know, from both sides, you have pro-life, pro-choice. I've been for women's health care. I, I uh, was I provided a bill that provided 7.4 million to Planned Parenthood. I believe that uh, you know it's a woman's choice. And I think at the end of the day, if you want to talk about this bill in, in, in its form, I don't know if it's going to if it's going to be there. My understanding that perhaps um, it'll be codified to be the law of the land, which is Roe versus Wade, and, and um, I think that's where it's going. But um, again, you know, I, I, I've sponsored uh, many bills for women's, women's health care, and I think it's important that we, um, we have that in place. Thank you. Mr. Palestina? It has a move because it's extreme and it's radical and shouldn't happen. And you're getting a lot of pushback from people over that bill, of which he's a co-sponsor of, you know, because it allows abortions in months seven, eight, and nine. We've all heard the story. It is a situation that many people don't agree with, don't want to see. You know, we got to build consensus around this issue. I think Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. We all support that. You know, give people the opportunity up till 22, 24 weeks. Uh, but there has to become a point where you have to protect that life. The life deserves the same protections we all enjoy. And so we've got to try to build consensus around the issue, not make this more extreme, not make it more divisive and more radical. It's just tearing us apart further. And so I think we've got to try to build some consensus over it, no matter which side of the aisle you're on on this issue. Thank you. And it's now time to move to closing statements. So each candidate will have 90 seconds. We'll start with Mr. Palestina. Well, thanks again, David and Micah. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, it was a great debate. I think we heard a lot of different views, a lot of different opinions on things. Uh, I think from my standpoint, there are many things we need to do in Atlanta County. Uh, we talked about the fact that there has been no population growth over the last decade. 
We know as we talk to people down here uh, that they are concerned about having an opportunity to put food on the table, have a good job with good pay, be able to retire here. We know people are leaving this area. Uh, we know we have to get these policies turned around. It starts with making Atlantic County and New Jersey more affordable. It starts with stopping the irresponsible spending and borrowing and tax increases we have seen. All of these things where they increase taxes and increase spending and increase debt, not only have an impact on taxes, but have an impact on the cost of everything that people are paying. And so we now see the impacts of inflation down here where people are going to the grocery stores and spending more, going to the gas stations, spending more clothing stores. It is impacting every facet of people's lives. And it's a situation which is becoming untenable to the point where if we don't really get this turned around, come up with a system uh, that is predicated upon spending money responsibly, giving people opportunity, giving people and investing people in their own personal responsibility to make the best decisions they can for themselves and their family, then we're gonna to continue to see an exodus of people. We can't have that. Get out there and vote the November 2nd. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Maz here for closing statements. Uh, thanks again to you, David, and uh, New Jersey Globe for hosting the conversation this evening. You know, I take running uh, for Senate seriously in 11 years as councilman and mayor. I had perfect attendance. In my eight years as assemblyman, I have not missed a voting session. I show up and I get the work done. Tonight, you have heard the clear and stark differences between myself and Mr. Palestina. I restored the funding to women's health care that he cut. I voted to cut taxes on working people when he did not. I was part of bringing Atlantic City back from the brink of bank bankruptcy. During the pandemic, my office helped thousands of people navigate unemployment and connected them with resources. Provided hundreds of millions of dollars to small businesses to help them through the pandemic. I've always done what's best for Atlantic County, including standing up to my party when I have to. Atlantic County has moved forward in the eight years I've been as an assemblyman and will continue to move forward when I'm in the Senate. The choice in front, in front of our voters is whether to go back to the past or to move forward in an independent financially stable, affordable, and thriving Atlanta County. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings the New Jersey Globe Second District State Senate debate between Democrat Vince Mazio, Republican Vince Palestino to a close. Uh, we'll be back next Sunday evening, October 24th, with a debate uh, for the eighth district seat between Democrat Dawn Adiago and Republican Gene Stanfield. And, and I remind everybody, voting has already started. Uh, if you received a vote by mail ballot and you haven't re returned it yet, please don't forget to do so. Uh, if you've already voted, please take responsibility for your ballot. Uh, use the Secretary of State's Track My Ballot tool. Uh, confirm that your ballot's been received. Nine days of early voting begins in six days. So, so please remember, if you don't vote, you lose the chance to complain about the outcome of this election. Uh, I'm David Wildstein, the editor of the New Jersey Globe. Thank you, Mr. Mazio. Thank you, Mr. Palestina, for participating in the debate. Uh, as always, thank you to Micah Rasmussen, the director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Ryder University. Uh, good night, everybody. Be well and good luck. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. See ya. Thank you, gentlemen. That was great.